Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Gayla Tia Strong. After getting a 100% on the NPTE, I co-founded SPT with me, designed to help DPT students who are about to take their NPTE actually understand content versus just trying to memorize everything. If you find this content helpful, please check out sptwithme.com for our three and six hour course to help you pass the NPTE. Now onto what you're actually here for, let's talk about the Canadian C-spine rules. What is it and when would we use it? So within the term Canadian C-spine rules, it literally says C-spine, meaning the cervical spine. It's very specific to this region. So if someone is coming in to see you for their ankle or any other body region, this should not be the first thing that comes to mind. Now, when you think about the Canadian C-spine rules, the first thing that probably pops into your mind is a chart. And this chart is a flow chart that guides you through a series of situations and steps that you need to take to help assist you in deciding whether or not a person should obtain a radiograph, aka an x-ray. Now, what this means is that you are using this chart to essentially assist you in ruling in or ruling out a cervical spine fracture. So here we're connecting the dots. You're using this chart if you suspect that a person could potentially have a fracture. Now, what kind of situations would a person be in to make the thought of a cervical spine fracture even a possibility in the first place? Well, for the most part, fractures, regardless of the body region, usually occur from something traumatic. A traumatic incidence doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be something crazy like falling off a cliff or off a skateboard. It honestly could just be something as simple as falling or sliding off a chair. Remember, it all depends on the person and the situation. For example, does the person have osteoporosis? How exactly did they land? Where did they land? Or uh, were they mobile enough to try to brace themselves? Well, this is the flow chart that I was talking about. It's a lot of information and you are always more than welcome to just memorize it. However, the reason I created SPT with me was to help you understand information versus just memorizing it. So let's do that. First things first, you need to make sure that a person is even appropriate to continue with an assessment. So let's use an example. Let's say you're on a freeway and unfortunately you just saw a car accident. Being the nice person that you are, you pull over to help this individual. But when you go check on them, you notice that they're knocked out unconscious. Now this is a very highly traumatic incident. A cervical fracture is likely. Now without even looking at the flow chart, if you see that a person is unconscious, or even if they are conscious but they can barely respond appropriately to you talking to them, should you grab their head and rotate the cervical spine or even try to get them to do it themselves? I am hoping that your answer is no. If a person is unconscious or they're cognitively impaired and you just physically force their neck to rotate, I mean, what could you possibly obtain from doing that? I mean, sure, maybe the person could start groaning and screaming in agony, letting you know that, that yeah, there's something wrong. But you're also running the risk of that person not being able to respond when there truly is something physically going on in the neck. So in this case, you're just risking fracturing and ripping their neck even more. So first things first, you need to make sure that this person is stable and responsive. Moving on to the next part. Kind of going back to the previous slide where I was talking about, you know, what would make you think that a person had a fracture in the first place? This is exactly where this comes into play. So at the top of this list, it's suggesting that anyone 65 years of age or older should get a radiograph if they have some sort of cervical spine pain. Now, obviously, just the fact of being 65 or older is not something that is traumatic. However, try to make sense of it. So as we age, our bones are not as strong as before. So there's a higher likelihood of an unexpected fracture to occur compared to a younger population. Now the amount of force that it takes at that age to actually create a fracture, again, it really just depends. How bad is their osteoporosis? Are they active? Are they taking any medications that might alter their bone loss progression? So if someone comes into your office who's maybe say 80 years old, and they haven't had an x-ray of their neck done in, in a while, but they're complaining of some neck pain, maybe suggest getting an x-ray. The next step is a dangerous mechanism. Without even looking at the asterisks and what comes under each one, what would you imagine is considered dangerous? Probably something high impact. Car accidents, falling from rock climbing, falling from a bike, a skateboard, getting kicked off by a horse, getting hit by a car, etc. I am sure there are a plenty of crazy scenarios that you guys will run across in your career. But these are super high impact, highly forceful incidences. So in a younger population, and especially an older population, there's a, a strong likelihood that a fracture can happen with something like this. So hopefully getting your patients to a radiograph in these kind of cases makes sense. 
Next up, another high risk factor that would mandate a radiograph is if a person is experienced paresthesias in the extremities. Now, I want you to look at the MRI image that I put on the bottom of the slide. This is a fracture. The bone is clearly pressing into the spinal cord. Now, every fracture does not have to present the same. You could experience all four extremities having paresthesia. It could be the upper extremity is only, it could be one extremity. It really just depends on exactly how the bones have shifted in order to create a compression or impingement on certain nerves. So to wrap up this section, if a person is 65 years or older, have gone through a traumatic incident or have paresthesias in any or all of the extremities, don't do anything else and tell that person to get an x-ray. And what I mean by don't do anything else is that you are not going to range that person's neck. You are not going to do MMTs. You are not going to continue any objective assessments because any movement or stresses that can worsen the fracture and even shift it so much that it does create a bigger problem than it already is. If your patient does not fit into any of the categories of the above box, this is when we move down to this one. Understand, it does not mean that your patient is any less likely to have a fracture. What the criteria in this box does is that it gives you the clear to assess a person's cervical rotation active range of motion. Their range is going to tell you whether or not they should get an x-ray. But before you range them, you need to clear them from all the criteria. So let's go over that criteria. So the first one says simple rear end. So think of a minor bumper to bumper car accident or you're at a Black Friday event and the crowds are just pushing you. So it's something that can jolt you, but it's really not that big of a deal. Now this one should make sense. It's not drastic. It's kind of just like, you know, someone just pushed you unexpectedly. So you should be safe enough to range the neck. Now the next one is if your patient is actually able to sit. Let's go back to this picture as an example. So let's say that your patient is able to sit in an upright position. If you look at this image, again, everyone's intensity of how severe their fracture is is going to be a little bit different. But if you look at this, I mean, sitting with this would be a pretty hard task to do. I mean, just imagine the effect of gravity squishing that top segment of the cervical spine onto that bottom segment. Number one, it seems like it would probably be incredibly painful to maintain that position. And number two, your cervical spine surrounding musculature has to be so strong just to be able to hold yourself up, despite the bones having lost its integrity and its strength. Structure. So if your patient can tolerate sitting and not be in, you know, crazy excruciating pain, then they're probably safe enough to try to rotate the neck. But again, that does not mean that if they can't sit that they don't have a cervical spine fracture, you have to test it out. Maybe it's just not as intense as the one that's shown in this picture. So if a person can sit and they actively rotate their neck greater than 45 degrees on both sides, then they might be more likely to not have a fracture. But we will get into the 45 degrees later. As we move down the chart, ambulatory at any time. This means that the person is able to move and walk after the injury. Again, let's go back to the image. So it's similar to the concept that we just talked about of the person being able to sit after their injury. However, just imagine if the person who sustained the cervical spine injury that's depicted on the MRI image at the bottom of the slide, if they were to walk, that would probably be even more excruciatingly painful compared to sitting because of all the shock that you experience every step that you take. So if a person has an intense fracture, uh, they probably could not withstand walking. However, the inability to walk could also be due to nerve compression. The nerve is just so compressed that you cannot physically walk. So if a person cannot walk following, tell them to get an x-ray. But if they can, you can try ranging them. Delayed onset of neck pain. Every single bone in our body has nerve innervations. Breaking a bone is painful. Now, of course, everyone has different perceptions of pain, but there is still going to be pain. So if you were to fracture any bone in your body, not just the cervical spine, you would have pain immediately. Pain from fractures does not come on a few days later. What can come on a few days later could be a muscle strain, but that's just not a fracture. Lastly, is there midline tenderness? Just note that this one is specifically talking about bony tenderness. Whether the fracture is located at the spinous process or interior to that region, if you're pushing on something that's broken that should be in one piece, but now is maybe split, that shearing that is going to happen from you pressing into it is definitely not going to feel good. So in this case, if there is midline bony tenderness, you want to get that person to get an x-ray.
So once all of the criteria are met of the second box, indicating that it is safe to assess your patient's cervical rotation, active range of motion, and see how far they can turn, this is when we can go to the third box. So if your patient is actively able to rotate their cervical spine to 45 degrees or greater on both sides, it's likely that they do not have a fracture. However, if it's 44 degrees, 40 degrees, etc., anything that's less than 40, uh, 45 degrees on even just one side, you should suggest that they go get an x-ray. So you should know that 80 degrees is what's considered normal range of motion, full range of motion for the cervical spine into rotation. However, realistically, 45 degrees is what's considered functional. Now, if your person cannot even reach 45, then that means something is wrong, right? Something's physically blocking them, or they're just in excruciating pain for a reason. Get them to get an x-ray. I want us to rationalize the actual use of this tool, and we're going to go through a few examples to see when you might or might not actually implement it. So example one, let's say you're working at a hospital or a clinic and you have a patient come in with some cervical spine pain. So you're looking through their chart and you do see an x-ray and the impression shows no fracture. However, your patient is describing some symptoms of paresthesia, they're having some difficulty rotating their cervical spine. So at this point, let me ask you, would you feel the need to send them back to the doctors and request for another x-ray? Now, unless there is something new that has happened between the time frame of when they were referred to you and when they actually saw you, my answer would be not necessarily. I mean, of course, getting a CT scan is better than an x-ray, but just remember that there are other diagnoses that can present with the same symptoms. Does what happened to them necessarily make a fracture an appropriate differential diagnosis? Now, another situation, let's say someone wakes up with a kink in their neck that never went away. There's no traumatic incident preceding that. They're below 65 years old, but you have them rotate their cervical spine and they can only go about 30 degrees because it just hurts so bad. Does this indicate that your patient might have a fracture? No, not necessarily. I mean, you have to use your clinical reasoning and good judgment to see realistically what is the cause of your patient's symptoms. So to summarize, I think it's important as always to conceptualize everything. Even though there are only three boxes among those other little bullet points that we saw in the flowchart, there's quite a lot of inf information in it. But if you think about the big picture, the idea is that someone is having neck pain that just went through some sort of unusual traumatic incidents. You know, unusual meaning that it wasn't just because you slept wrong, it's not that you just quickly rotated your head or that you lifted a barbell wrong. It's an incident that was a little more intense than normal. Additionally, yes, being 65 years old, old or older that's not traumatic however it's just something in addition that you need to keep in mind check out these references if needed if you're taking the mpte soon and enjoyed this content check out sptwithme.com for our three and six hour mini npte courses to help you figure out what exactly you need to know for the exam